Okay, welcome everyone to today's October Adoption User Group. Uh, it's uh, great to have you all here. It's a little quieter today. It's interesting ever since Microsoft made some of the changes to the tenant, people aren't getting those kind of auto notifications anymore. The session is recorded and it will actually go live uh, online on YouTube. Please feel free to uh, uh, subscribe to the YouTube account. It's the best way for you to be able to get the notification to say that the recording has gone live if you wish to actually go back. There you go. Now, uh, in terms of the microphone, if I can ask if we can please just stay on mute if you do have a question. Now, I will open up towards the end of the session, or you can always type into chat at any point and I will answer and or when Greg comes on to present, he can also answer any questions along the way. I ask that if you are and you have got a question and you do want to come off mute, maybe once, you know, Greg kicks in, you may want to raise your hand to ask questions if required. You can, of course, turn on closed captions at any point. I can talk fast, so it's a good way to be able to keep up with me and or if English is your second language for those that are visiting us from overseas. So please feel free to turn on your closed captions at any point. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting from today and I extend that respect to only elders past, present and emerging that have actually joined us and extend that respect any to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders people who are here with us today. I ask that we all be kind, welcoming, open to different viewpoints as this technology can be sometimes somewhat divisive. Um, I ask that we be kind, understanding, considerate, that we use appropriate gifts in chat and that we're patient and friendly. This is a community group so I do ask that everyone is respectful along the way. My name is Kirsty McGrath for anyone that is new, although I think everyone here is has been previously. Uh, I am an adoption consultant and run the user groups for Australia, which has been um, about eight and a half years, coming up to nine years now. I always do a bit of a what have I been up to, so I finally received my puck for my seventh year award. It came in the mail, tiny little glass thing, doesn't feel like much, just slide it on. Uh, apart from that, I have been up to Brisbane to the three-day State Queensland seminar and I made a uh, hat and a clutch purse in terms of caking. I had my hand at a uh, doing a little bit of crochet. We've got I've got a group of friends that I do my bushwalking with, and we're teaching each other our skills and hobbies. I don't think I did too badly for my very first go at crocheting, although I'm not sure I'll be taking that one up as a hobby, considering all the hobbies I do have already. Um, up at the state show, I also was doing a little bit in terms of understanding how to flood colours on fondant. I did down the bottom here. I did a um, also a marshmallow class, and then that marshmallow class I learned how to do flowers out of marshmallow piping flowers which was a bit of fun the next one along is some buttercream it was father's day so the family got together um, and amongst all that I wound my head down with some jigsaw puzzle but on um, Sunday we had a birthday party for my daughter and uh, she is actually turning 29 tomorrow so you know it's a bit of a, a thank you to my daughter and has my screen locked up let's just see let me come over here and of course my screen my powerpoint has all locked up as it does ah it's always the way me hey. like come on be nice i pulled my pen out to start drawing on things and it didn't like it clearly righty oh i guess i'll have to just stop powerpoint and and restart let's do let's do a bit of a restart <clears throat> just end the task Considering it doesn't want to start, joys of the beautiful sunset at the moment. <laughs> there we go. Open that one back up again. Of course, it would crash. It's always the way. And I was up to here. There we go. My daughter's 29th birthday. And that was the cake that I made her for her 29th birthday. An awful lot of work and detail. She did she did love it. So we did have a bit of fun with it. Hey, right, let's get stuck into what's new in adoption. Okay, as part of the release notes, there wasn't a massive amount that was actually put up there on the adoption page. Sometimes if you are looking at those release notes, 
Some of the things on those release notes, uh, the links can actually be broken. I do report them, but unfortunately, they're not actually fixing a lot of what I'm reporting at the moment. I'm trying to escalate a few things to try and try and help out, but there is some. There's a few broken links along along the along the line. So we'll see what we can do. The next champions call is actually coming up in October, towards the end of October. And the topic is going to be in terms of Microsoft lists. They've now moved over to the new platform. Remember, they did do a bit of a, a break in August. So we're now up to September. If you have a looking at September, it does go through the Curb Pilot Success Kit. So it just walk through them, what's there, what's actually changed. Um, it also went through OneDrive and understanding some of the changes and updates that are actually coming into OneDrive. Um, some great content in there. If you're doing kind of OneDrive training or anything along those lines, go in and have a look and download the PowerPoints. So I think that's the, one of the reasons I do love the Champs calls. And it always gives me some um, good screenshots and, and information to be able to work with to continue on in my um, my own education piece. Okay, so after that champion's call, a couple of things that came through is if you wanted to, you can go watch the actual recording. It has now live. They do put them up kind of over on YouTube, so you can watch them over on YouTube as well as on the new page. And uh, it's always a, a bit of a good idea to go and have a little bit of a look. Now, Caruana put out there the new user enablement specialist course. We used to have our adoption specialist kind of course that you could actually go through. It's changed over to user enablement. Now, that user enablement course is focused on Copilot now. So it's kind of not overarching just 365 anymore. It is based on Copilot, but there is a lot in there around the Microsoft 365 that you could get in and go through. It takes about two hours to go and do the course if it's something that you're interested to have under your belt, the new course. Um, one that I would recommend, the course code is MS4007. Make sure that you've actually logged in to Microsoft Learn and then that way those points and information will actually go against your profile. So you'll see here in terms of it's got five modules in the learning path around about two and a half hours. Okay. So the modules um, are going to go through strategies. It's going to go, what does it look like in terms of the envisioning program, onboarding, driving value, and how you can extend and optimize. So, um, and of course, extending and optimizing, you know, starts to go in some of the some of the other capabilities around, um, uh, you know, getting into the copilot. Um, um, I got to think of the word in a minute. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so after that, now Mondays at Microsoft, what I'm finding interesting is that the champs calls are really no longer being run by, you know, Caruana. They've actually gone back, gone over to Josh and Jesse are kind of running those now. And you're going to find that um, Caruana and Heather are now more focused on the Mondays at Microsoft. Now the Mondays at Microsoft, of course, run every single Monday for us in terms of our timing, you know, that one, two o'clock in the morning, not so great. Um, however, but you can go and actually watch those recordings and, uh, and and join in through there and, you know, can do comments and a few other things in terms and ask questions there. Now, sometimes it does slide into the more technical. Um, you'll see that there is actually a list here in terms of, you know, what's actually come in the past. Um, it is a little bit of a focus on the AI components. So, you know, do take that into consideration. I'm just going to mute you, Jennifer. So, um, the last one in terms of the Monday's episode 33 has actually gone live. There is some interesting information in there. Um, one I would recommend, it does talk a little bit about the, um, the the new wave in terms of co-pilot, so one to go and have a look at what's in that success kit. Now, having gone live in terms of general availability, new outlook, is out there. There is more videos that have actually gone live over the last two weeks to be able to help and support you based on some of the new features. So something to go and have a bit of a watch. Um, not only that, but there are 17 videos there if you're needing to do training, if you are rolling out the new Outlook internally. Now in the Loop Learning Series, I think I had put up the first 
three on our previous session as to um, what you could go and watch. We did the original, you know, go and register if you wish to. Now they're all available on demand. So the recordings are there and available. So you can go in and, you know, meet Copilot in loop. So this is the, you know, Copilot inside it. It's got um, uh, the Q&A with the actual loop team. So the loop team is coming in. So that's part five. Then you can go and have a look at governance and management control, um, controls. That's number six. And uh, on the back of that, you can, it's, so it's outside of the series, but it's also, it's still kind of part of that series a little bit. So Marsh Cash, Mark Cashman has taken it live. You've got the Microsoft Ask Me Anything session, as well as the Internet Zone podcast. So the Internet Zone podcast was focused on Microsoft Loop. So there are two things there um, on this particular page that you could actually go and watch the videos of, and it's got a little bit of an outline there as well. Okay. There is a video that's gone live now. It's on YouTube and as part of those adoption resources. It's with Caruana and Coffee in the Cloud. She's going through what's available around Microsoft Lists. So if you're not quite sure what's there, um, if you haven't been on the previous session that I've gone through, uh, maybe a good idea to go and have a watch of the recording and it will walk you through. There is a bit of... There is some new content and sometimes we don't always see it go live in the, um, um, you know, what's new when it comes to adoption. So every now and again, there is a few things. So in there is a, you know, go to the adoption page, what's actually a little bit new and some links as well. Now. In the past, I had actually put up the Microsoft Lists virtual workshop, and that was some time ago. I think it was back in 2022, 21, maybe 21 or 22. But there is some content that's actually been dropped in there that I found that wasn't there previously. Now, if you go in down the bottom here, as part of that two-part workshop, the on-demand, there is in there a PowerPoint presentation with the speaker notes as well as an Excel file so that you could do a create a list from the Excel file. So it's all kind of there prepped and ready and what to actually do. Now, the additional materials is just the standard content that's actually available around lists on the um, Microsoft Lift adoption page. But those two opponents above it you can go in there and as part of that it's got what is in the virtual workshop a ton of pages to be able to help and support you um, around how to do things now look the technology has shifted just a little bit but there's still some really good content in there that I would recommend um, that you go and actually have a look at to be able to help and support you so um, one to one to go look at now yeah. available on this YouTube channel is what is that next phase around, you know, Microsoft 365. This was on the Mondays at Microsoft. So we looked, I had up previously episode 33. This is episode 34. And in there is a little bit around, you know, what's actually going on, plus some of the enhancements that are available for SMB. Two components to have a look at. Now, there are, of course, other things that might actually interest you on the list, but some of this does go into um, a little bit more, I suppose, than some of the technical, and I'm a little bit more focused on the end user components. So um, one to maybe have a look at. Now, Microsoft Teams Emergency Center V3 is now available. Okay, so you now do have your V3 version. Um, you might notice I'm a, I'm a little croaky. I had laryngitis in the last <laughs> in the last month while I was away. Cross fingers, I won't lose my voice. But um, it's been up and down for the last sort of two to two to three weeks. So please bear with me as I drink some water and, and try not to get too croaky. Okay. Um, so go and have a look at um, the video that's available, walks you through what is it, what can you do, what are the changes, some screenshots, how can you, like the, you know, a bit of a um, to do on on how to actually use it. I, I do like it. So if you haven't actually seen what it is, you might want to go watch the video. You can kind of skip through a bit of that introduction and jump to the core of, you know, how do you, um, how do you set up, how do you use now, town halls in Microsoft Teams, um, the adoption site has been doing its update around, you know, what features are generally available and what's coming in Q3. A couple of little shifts here and there on the list compared to um, last year. And you can always go and have a look, of course, at the roadmap. Another one, you've got the Viva community call was out there. 
And on that community call in September was the five ways to accelerate the workforce in terms of transformation. I did put previously last month the link to if you wanted to join. This is now the recording has actually gone up. Um, Mike Holstey has there uh, at, you know, doing a great job and talking about what's going on across the Viva space. So it's more than just Viva Engage. Um, now in there, when Mark starts to talk, he's going a little bit into that uh, adoption kit when it comes to Viva, if you're looking around the co-pilot components, um, there's a couple of uh, interesting pieces as well as some screenshots, some of the stats and information around change management and some of the ways that we can actually push out the deployment kit and why we should do it and the ways that we should do it. So um, you might want to jump. It sits, um, this particular page is at uh, 30 minutes and 37, but if you go in at around the 30 minutes 30, it's where it's kind of kicking off with Mike, at one to go and read. Uh, please go keep an eye out on the community news desk, some great information that's actually flowing in there, not just from the Microsoft adoption team, but from a lot of the members that sit there across the community pushing information out around what's actually going on. You can also go into the Microsoft Community Learning Channel. This is, of course, MVP specialists that are actually putting information in there. Lots of great learning content. One I recommend you might want to go and subscribe to. Okay. Some major updates to the Copilot Success Kit that's actually going on. Um, now, I've jumped into some of the adoption content. We've just been waiting for Greg to join. Um, Greg, welcome. We'll come back. We'll get you to join in a second before I start on the what's new to um, Microsoft 365 features and functionality. So thanks for joining, Greg. Okay, so the major updates to the Copilot Success Kit. Um, um, the success kit in terms of some of the content that's in there. Now, this is a blog going through sort of what are all the various components. Now, let me talk you through some of these components. So um, when you go into the Copilot success kit, now there's been some updates to the adoption kit as well as success kit. They are two kits, okay? So two different kits with different information in them. Now, if you go in and you go download that full success kit, then what you're going to find is some information to be able to help and support you. When you go and download the success kit, there is a little bit of difference from one to the other. Now, in the past, when we start to have a look at, you know, what was in there and what was of old, so, you know, what was there, what was there previously in terms of the old? Now, where have the changes come in? The change has come in when we start to, and you can download the training kit on its own from the page, by the way. So there's some changes in the training kit. There's some changes that have actually come in in terms of the user enablement tools. Now, the onboarding engaged emails that was sort of over here has actually now gone into the user enablement toolkit. So you'll start to see where there's some of the shifts. So you're kind of going, well, should I download it or not? I, you know, I think so, yes. But if you have your original one, don't throw it out. So don't press delete on it just yet because there's still some stuff that's actually in there that I did quite like. Like, you know, it's dropped off the PDFs in terms of leading in the era of AI. You can go and sort of download it, um, uh, some of this standalone, but if you still want to keep it, I would say keep it. Now, there has been a bit of a naming change. So when you have a look at the naming change, some of this stuff is exactly the same, but it has have a name change. However, there is some new content that's actually come into play. You've got the user experience strategy has now dropped into it, the onboard ex, um, engage accelerate and the technical readiness. So the technical, of course, is a little bit more in the technical space. It's not as much focused on the things that we do, but this sort of onboarding kit has been dropped in there. Now, some of this we've actually found and was sort of over in the adoption kit and has come over into the success kit. So there's been a bit of a shuffle around. Now, when we go into these folders, so inside the trainer kit, some of this content um, is exactly the same. However, some of it is new. 
Now, the training content map has had a bit of an update. It's a bit of an easier read, so I'll show you that in a minute. One of the components that's actually new is this work versus the web around Copilot. So that's actually new. And uh, some of the other content, let me show you if I come through. So this is the this is the um, work versus web PDF was what it, uh, some of the stuff used to be PDF and it's not, it's now PowerPoint. So this is the work versus the web, sort of differentiating between those sort of toggle components and what you're going to get across the two. So that kind of helps them to sort of untangle a little bit as to what you're going to get. This is the new training documentation that's actually in there now. You'll notice I particularly like the layout. It's got some new little icons to be able to make it easier to sort of find out what you've got there. So that is a bit of a cleanup on the previous version. Now, another component that was there on the on that list of the PowerPoints is a PowerPoint has been put in to the training deck on getting started with Microsoft Copilot in Excel. Now, there's some really great content in there, and I would highly recommend having a look. Screenshots, not necessarily in terms of live demo, but, you know, it's fairly easy for you if you wish to start creating some kind of your own content off the back of what you could see on the screen if you liked. You could effectively maybe, you know, take that over and, and build it out but it's actually got the like some training content in there I would recommend now if you wish to and if you're trying to get yourself up to speed in terms of Excel because Copilot Excel is now generally available we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute um, it has been available and uh, there's a uh, sorry a LinkedIn training course in terms of Copilot and AI in Excel has actually been available in LinkedIn Learning and it has been made free to the end of 2025. So I've put the link in here for anyone that wants to go in and learn off the back of, you know, George's course. It has been made free. So this is, I mean, of course, this technology does change uh, somewhat quickly. So it's always only as good as the next, I suppose, couple of months. Some things will be exactly the same, but some things will shift as new features and functionality rolls out. Um, but you might want to put it out even within your business now that it's gone to general availability. Maybe you want to talk about it and say, here's a free course. Now, inside the success kit, as part of that download and underneath the user comms, so if I, you know, there was the, um, um, you know, the user enablement in there underneath the comms piece, the change that's come in was it used to just be, you know, email week one, two, three, four, five, six, kind of seven. That was it. It has now been bundled together based on a particular type of business. So if you're a, you know, a very finance business or maybe a HR comms or your legal teams and all the above, you now have individual emails that you can actually send out. The Word document is all those emails just in Word format that you can actually use to, you know, copy and paste and create your own emails and or you can use the um, Microsoft OFT files to be able to customise if you wish to. So there are two ways that you could actually run that. And underneath each one of these is literally emails one to six with the wording changed a little based on a um, bit of the scenario and the focus on finance or HR, for example. So I'm liking some of those changes. Um, maybe keep your original still as part of the comms. Now inside the manager pack. So underneath the user enablement is now a manager pack, a manager enablement pack. And in there is a manager email as to what you can do saying it's coming. There is both a Word document, so you can see the Word document here, or the actual um, Outlook OFT files if you wanted to, plus the either the PowerPoint or the PDF functionality around 10 ways that you can use Copilot. Maybe, for example, you're wanting to take out, um, maybe you're not using Loop or it's turned off for the business or hopefully it's not, but um, it's just an example. You can customise or put in your own if you want to focus on it. So 10 ways to use it. Okay. Inside the adoption kit itself, 
underneath that um, user, uh, sorry, the adoption kit, not the customer success kit. So this is the adoption kit. There has been some changes. Now, the one thing that you might actually note here, um, what we've got here is in terms of the uh, the user training deck, it's had a bit of a change. It's reduced down its pages to 31 from 41 pages. So it's had a had a bit of a sort of a scale back. Um, another component is that the five tips here in PDF are now in PowerPoint format. Loving some of these changes because the pure PowerPoint was can be quite frustrating. A lot of times we need to actually customize content or pull things out. So I'm liking some of these changes. The interactive introduction to Copilot has been removed. This is kind of one of those components that's been moved over into the success kit in terms of the, the training component. So it has had a bit of an adjustment. Um, the image creation with designer has been pulled out. So designer as a presentation is completely gone from all over the place from the success from the adoption kit so these are one of the reasons I say maybe don't delete your original one you'll also note that there's the the um, IT admins kind of document has been dropped out of the adoption kit and the messaging series is exactly the same it's just had a bit of a name change and the two emails that were actually in there you'll see six seven it's just had a name change you'll also note that the videos have been removed there is no videos from the old to the new so if there's something in particular you still wish to be able to use please take note don't delete your old kit okay now, in terms of the scenario lively, there has been some changes that have gone in there, some new industry and functional use cases. And um, I think the main thing that I'm particularly liking is the subject matter expert videos. So, for example, if you go into the um, human resources one, you've got watch overviews, watch demos, for example, that have come into play. You know, we did have some of the um, uh, PowerPoints down below, but we're starting to see some more content flowing through. As a part of that scenario library, it's getting quite comprehensive in terms of the functionality. Now, the underneath the operations side of it, so the change um, uh, scenario that's in there is still broken. I have reported it now for um, this is the third month I've actually reported it being broken. It still has not been fixed, guys. Um, I am kind of harassing them. We'll see if maybe we can organise it. Okay. Um, in terms of um, some of the, you know, the what's new, there is a meet the makers when it comes to uh, Copilot in SharePoint. So if you want to go in and watch that, Caruana has actually put that out as a webinar. I did talk about registering for it previously. It's now available to watch. <laughs> there are some new white papers that have gone live. Now, this is on the Microsoft, do you know how to Microsoft do it? If you go and have a look, the three proven ways to use uh, to make message um, to make AI usage stick. So these are com these are things that Microsoft have done internally as part of their program over the last eighteen months to try and you know boost um, the usage. The things that they've actually done across you know thousands of employees, they run a they ran a lot of sessions. And what I particularly liked was uh, that they created a program and called it what a great idea. And what are your ideas of things that you can actually use? And as part of this component, a lot of people started you know posting things under the kind of the tagline of sort of what a great idea. And it started to look at um, an increase of the usage of Microsoft 365 apps. They did gamification where there was some financial rewards around scavenger hunts and bingo and all sorts of stuff that they started to include as part of meetings for a particular team. And they started to see a 31.77% spike in daily usage of Copilot. Um, and 365 and they did a rally the team so they did a whole heap of quick learning bites and they started to see some shift in terms of things just simple like you know drafting an email using copilot and across one side it was even 14 percent spike increase so um, ways that they've actually done it go and have a look go and have a little bit of a read we're nearly finished on um, greg on the um, um what's new to adoption 
So another component in terms of the right way to co-create with AI, some of the some of the uh, outtakes of this from Microsoft's information and how they've actually done it and looked at some of the real world research across a few organisations, that there was different habits that came into play to be able to, to you know, support um, an organisation where, you know, it helped employees across the consumer goods space to spend less time reading emails. 81%. That's a significant amount of time. Um, so it's different organizations as part of that research uh, that they spent less time in meetings and that they produced uh, more content, 58% more content. And for law, you know, that is a, uh, that's a bit of a bonus because, you know, usually they're um, charging for everything that they do. So <laughs> another component. Now there is in the Viva space, the it takes a village to make AI copilot successful. There was some information in sorry underneath the my apologies underneath the foresters. Um, now you can purchase the report. It isn't cheap. It depends on whether you've got foresters in your business. However, it has actually gone out into um, two posts: one up on LinkedIn and one on their sites with key information that's actually come out of that particular report. If you don't wish to purchase it, um, with some really good content, one to go and have a bit of a read. Microsoft have put out the four work smarter productivity tip newsletters. Um, one is around analyzing competitors, one in regard to planning events, one in regard to securing insights, and one in regards to customer service. So this is productivity hints, tips, how to do it. Um, Microsoft have actually put out there a um, the using Copilot to demo Copilot. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you aren't quite sure, you haven't quite got files to demo Copilot, if you've got Copilot, you can actually create fictitious information. Like you can go into a document, for example, and say in Excel, can you please create, you know, fictitious tables of row for a particular time? Type of this one's an accounting firm, or maybe you're in the in a um, retail space, or in focused on something in particular. You know, so you can actually get it to create fictitious information. Now, I have actually done this before, hadn't thought too much about it um, in terms of you know, can you create some content that I could actually use? Because I've kind of done it in PowerPoint, creating um, presentations, and uh, I've done it in Word, where I've gone create for me a a, a demo out lines for this, this or this. Um, but, you know, some good content in there, um, even in regards to create fake emails for me or create fake content that I can use to take over. So some um, ways to be able to work with that. Now, Microsoft have made the Copilot Academy generally available to all 365 Copilot users now. So not just the those that had the Viva Learning Suite subscription. So if you had the, the higher level of subscription to Viva was when you got it. It's now generally available across um, all 365 licenses. So I'm liking that. There's the Microsoft Grow Your Business series. So this is the SMB space. How can you use Copilot um, to be able to support you in your operations? There are two upcoming co-pilot uh, community calls that you can actually go and um, uh, watch. So that was sort of from last time. Now you can go watch those two recordings, both across the SMB space. Now, whether it's SMB or not, it's still kind of relevant in terms of enterprise. I'm finding there's some good information in there. There is a, um, in the community hub, there's a newsletter around, you know, how has Copilot helped to enhance businesses to innovate? This is around the Wave 2. It's very similar to the Wave 2 content that you're going to see for enterprise. Okay, so not a lot different. Now, the customer hub has more um, live sessions that you can actually go and register for across all the different topics, whether it be Teams, comms, you know, um, Copilot, Go and have a look. I'm ready to put that up. Um, there's the Think Like a Scientist in terms of Viva Insights. This is a lot and focused on Glint as well. 
uh, some really good content in there when it comes to focusing on change management uh, around some of the concerns for change process, um, uh, good presentations, and you can download down the very bottom of the page. So if you kind of go you know, down a little further on this particular page when you go in, there is a um, download PDF. You can go and walk through it. I've put the link in here. Okay. There is the Meet the Makers for SharePoint clicks. There is coming up a OneDrive digital event available um, only next week. If you wish to actually join it, you can put the calendar invite on. That's going to be, I think it's 2 o'clock in the morning for us if you wanted to go and watch or I'll put the link up for the pre for the recording a little later. But it's the What's New to OneDrive. Don't forget to go and have a look at Community Day. What are the calls that are actually coming up? Um, have a look at the Viva events. There's a new one coming up in terms of AI empowerment for HR. So if that's um, off the back of our, you know, previous session with the HR team, it might interest you. Uh, another one that I've got in here that I've just dropped in and I will go over and we'll get um, Greg to present now. But please go in and go look at the Microsoft Community Answers page. If there's anything that you're not sure or you've got questions around, because I often do get lots of questions sent to me on LinkedIn or via emails or online or against some of the videos that we might put on, you can always come in to answers, go and find an answer and actually post answers in there across a ton of different topics, okay? Even including some of the things that actually sit on the Insiders channel. There is the, down a little lower, but the Windows Insider and then there's the Microsoft 365 Insiders in regards to some of those new features. Okay, so let me now jump to, we'll jump over and I'll, I'll introduce Greg before we get into the what's new to Microsoft 365. Thank you, Greg, for being a uh, patient. So, Greg. Ah, good to see you and thank you. Hopefully all is well. Um, we've got Greg. He is the Chief Inclusion Ear from All Equal and he's the Principal Accessibility Specialist at Service New South Wales. Um, he is an ex-MVP. Uh, I met him in my MVP days and I know that he has helped some of those that might even be on the call. And I do really appreciate you coming in and, and joining us for this session. Uh, Greg, I know you can't be an MVP anymore now that you're in Gov. It's always the, it's always the downside. <laughs> I'll stop sharing so that you can take Take over and maybe do a bit more around introducing yourself. Thanks, Kirsty, and welcome everybody. And thank you, Kirsty, for the opportunity to uh, speak about all things accessibility and inclusion, and how it's embedded right throughout M365, and how we should be leveraging it. So let's get started. I'm just going to uh, make sure, as always, that I. Um, share through teams and why am i going to share through teams of course because it's more accessible that way and that's one of the first messages of course to everybody um, is making sure that when you deliver your powerpoint presentations you do do that um, because it then allows the end user to have a more inclusive experience which is what we want to uh, see in that process um, so first off of course in the spirit of reconciliation i'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout the lands on which we meet today and their connections to land sea and community and pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all aboriginal and torres strait islander peoples today i'm lucky enough to come to you from wiradjuri country up here in orange um, home of about 52 wineries. Um, I didn't mention those 52 wineries, did I, Kirsty? No, um, no. Wonderful <laughs> place. Very important. It is indeed. So, look, what are we going to cover? What does good look like in accessibility and inclusion? How do we express that as a business requirement? And that's really important. What systems and processes do you need to have in place to deliver that? And how do you know those systems and processes are working? Because we've all been in place where we go, oh, see on this and it's sitting there gathering dust so how do you know every, everything's actually working uh, my day job is in service as we've said and look we're the one-stop shop here in new south wales for government services we're a, a big m365 tenant 
And we've got over 1,300 types of transactions that happen for customers. And we offer that across an omni-channel, the shop fronts, the phone, and in digital. I'm in the digital space, surprise, surprise. And we have 67 services that we deliver end-to-end -end in that space. Let's set the scene about where our problem is. Your mindsets and actions, so anybody you're working with, right, when they're put in 365, you go, okay, guys, are you intentionally including and enabling or are you unwittingly excluding and disabling people? And that's a big issue for us because it's actually costing the organisation a lot of money and also affecting their brand. Now, the impact of that poor mindset it's like this. The Microsoft research shows that any one product, there's only about 22% of people that like the product and can use it really easily. About another 16% will have some difficulty and irritation. 37% go prefer not to use it because they've got some difficulty. And 25% are actually excluded. Now, why does that happen, that mismatch? We make assumptions about people with disabilities and about customers of diverse needs and backgrounds there. So if I asked any of you and said, hey, what's the first thing that comes into mind when you think about a person with a disability? Nine times out of 10, you'll go to the archetypes. You'll look at the edge of the edge users and you go, oh, it's a person in a wheelchair or it's a person with a mobility cane. Over 80% of disabilities are invisible. And so now those assumptions that we make, they limit, limit our thinking and they, our actions. In a lot of cases, organisations only see accessibility as a nice have rather than an essential requirement. And we lack good governance and good controls. And we've got the tools within M365 to actually provide the good quality control and the good governance on there. Now it comes into three things. We want to improve your mindsets, the maturity within the organisation and the metrics around what we do. Now, across Australia and New Zealand, um, and there's 100, over 160 countries that have signed up to the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Article 9 says it's about accessibility and it's an enabling right because without accessibility, how do I do employment, health, politics, justice system, you name it. In Australia, we've got the Disability Discrimination Act, which says we need to provide services to people on an equal basis. It's also covered in a very uh, range of state legislation. So here, it's in the Anti-Discrimination Act, and it's also in the Work Health and Safety Act. We have it in our Australian standards, and I'm lucky enough now to be a member of um, Standards Australia on their IT40 committee, which looks at accessibility. That uh, Australian standard accessibility requirements for the ICT, it's an exact copy of the European standard. It's what Canada uses. And so any organisation that's looking at selling services across the US, across Europe, across Canada, they've got to meet that standard. The only difference between Australia's standard and the European standard is page two. And guess what? It says this is an exact copy of the European standard. A lot of organisations um, have signed up to ISO 3100 to do with risk management. So a lack of accessibility is a risk for the organisation. There's the digital services standards at a federal level, also at state level. Most governments have a range of different um, reporting requirements and also have issues to do with risk management. And all organisations that I've seen so far have something on their vision and their values. Now, the first step in changing mindsets in your organisation about how you leverage 365 is breaking down your customer demographics. Now, the data I'm showing you here is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So 47% of adults in Australia have less than functional literacy. What does that mean? Oh, it's about a year nine, sorry, a nine-year-old reading age. So think about family members, you go, oh, yep, 
I've either got kids who are nine or, or younger, or I've got other rallies who are, you know, I've got kids of that age. That's the reading level. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how we can use Copilot and a range of things on that. 24, well, 21.4 of our population has a permanent disability. That's up from the last census data, which was sitting at about 18%. We have 17.5% of uh, our adults in New South Wales are carers. 23.5% were over 60. So that's a huge number for us there. And the next biggest group is the 50 to 59 year old. 26.7% are born overseas, 29% percent, nearly a third of our customers don't speak English at home. And we know that location and, and climate can also amplify the need for accessibility. The biggest thing, what's the average age of your adults? It's 39. What do we know about people that have um, now hit that age? So let's have a little think about that one as we go along. Here's what we know about every customer. So we've seen the demographics. Let's break that down. Every customer is unique. Every customer will experience somewhere along the line difficulty completing tasks. And every customer interacts with your products differently. Now, how do I make those three statements? Well, let's look at this. Everyone's unique. Look at age, gender, culture, language, ability, disability, levels of education, their location. So what is it from Bondi to Bankstown to Blackdown to Burke and Bathurst and Broken Hill? What's their level of income? What's their access to technology? Their level of connectivity? What's their cognitive, sensory, and physical literacy abilities? All of those things mean that everybody's unique and that no one's average. One of the things that we notice is that you can be um, average in one attribute, but not in another. Remember, an average is a mathematical concept. So if I'm talking about myself, look, I'm just on uh, 183 centimetres. You know, I am above average in my waist measurement. I am below average in my leg measurement. I've got short legs and a long body. And then you come across to, and start to think about your cognitive abilities here, your memory, your language, knowledge, reading, vocab, curiosity, perceptual capabilities, your cognitive abilities, your interests, your social and your sensory. Now, if it's about dark chocolate, Irish whiskey and good jazz, I'm going to be high. If it's about quadratic equations, I'm going to be pretty low. And of course, it depends on what it's like on a Monday morning or on a Friday afternoon. It all changes. And we know that everybody is going to have difficulty with tasks. Why? It could be because of their permanent disability. It could be temporary or episodic through accident or illness. It could be progressive through illness and age. It could be trauma, um, which can be disaster related or domestic violence related as well. And it can be situational limitations. But just on that trauma one, I want you to think about if you've got young kids, you'll, you know, or had young kids at one stage, you'll remember what it was like with a lack of sleep and having to try and do tasks. Your cognitive capabilities went out the window a fair bit. Now let's look at domestic violence. And now let's look at, look at uh, disaster situations. Lack of sleep, lack of food, lack of safety, lack of housing, right? There's a whole range of things. And so the cognitive load is amplified even further in those situations. And of course, you've got those situational limitations there as well. Yeah trying to nurse um, a child or working in bright sunlight. That's why we now talk about um, disability as a spectrum here, going from that permanent to temporary to situational. And this is from the Microsoft Inclusive Design um, Toolkit, which I love. And you'll see that we now talk about disability being like a condition plus barriers. Now, on the top right hand kind here, we're looking look at the hearing one going from deaf to an ear infection to a bartender. And you go, hmm, 
if you've been in a noisy pub, you've all been situationally deaf. You can't hear each other. And what do you do? You start to yell over the top of each other. And that's part of that process. Uh, and so recognising there is that diversity of need. The other thing in understanding the complexity of our customers is this. Whilst we talk about a one in five in the population having a, a permanent disability, under the age of 18, it's one in nine. That Remember I said, hey, average age of our adults just in New South Wales, but it's pretty much the same Australia-wide. You start to see this thing called wear and tear in the body around the age of late 30s, early 40s there. You know, your short and long focal length, your eyes adjusting to that, isn't quite as good. You start to see some other um, bits. You're not quite as match fit as you used to be. At the age of 55, it's one in three. At the age of 67, it's one in two. Now, that's important. A 60-year-old receives about a third of the light of what a 20-year-old is. So that's why I know when people are, are creating documents and they go, honey, I'm sorry, that really fine white typeface in a grey, you know, an 11 point, is not going to do it. Why? Because it lacks legibility. So it's going to increase my cognitive load in trying to wade through it, same as single line spacing. Think about older members of your family. What do they do? They drive less at night. They'll have brighter lights at home. As they get older, they'll prefer matinee performances over nighttime performances. And yes, we'll complain about having to bend down to go and get our favourite item on the bottom shelf now of, of, uh, of Woolies or Coles. But the issue is this. That's not just some of our population. It's all of our population. So thinking about how we implement Microsoft 365 or any tool through the place is thinking about how do we build in personalization for people within there. And so that's why it's looking about how our customers use our products differently. Some are using it as is, some are per you're setting up the personalized settings on their devices, and others are using assistive technology features within there. Now, I want you to think about, now this is me who doesn't drive a car, okay? What do you do when you hop in your car? Your car? You personalize your driving position and you get ticked off if somebody has adjusted your driving position. Who's been sitting in my chair? Because you've got to go, yeah, is my seat coming forward or backwards? You know, have I got the mirrors right? Is everything else right? Right, so you've personalised that experience. Personalisation is the key to dealing with the complexity of the different customer needs. But when we do it right, we enable some pretty amazing things. And I'm just going to show you one of my favourite little videos here. Um, um, it's from Apple. One of the things about that is showing what, uh, what people can do. Hey Siri, set my morning scene. It's currently clear and 71 degrees. Today's high will be 80 degrees. Open weather, swipe left.
that's your customers, folks. So the question is, how do we shift left? We've got to acknowledge that we've got bias in our system at the moment. We've got to learn from those customers, adopt inclusive processes, and we've got to solve for one extent to many. Now, earlier on, I talked about this permanent and temporary and situational. On the US stat, there are 26,000 people with a permanent loss of one arm on any one day. There are 13 million people with a temporary loss of one arm through injury or illness. There's the situational impairment of people trying to nurse a child and do tasks around the house with one arm. That's another 8 million. So when we fix it for the 26,000 first rather than last, we actually benefit 21 million. And that's what we want to look at is how do we benefit all of an organisation, whether it's the staff or the customers, and how do we use those tools to make that happen? So how do we build your maturity up? The first thing's this, and it's the leadership conversation, and it's setting a core requirement. And so one of those things that we're doing at the moment is looking at how all customers can easily and safely use the digital products and services to complete the tasks they need to, regardless of their background or ability. That's the core delivery requirement. What's the benefits to the organisation though? We're going to enable maximum use of the products by the widest possible audience. We're going to decrease complexity and improve usability. We're going to drive innovation because accessibility and inclusion leads to innovation. We're going to improve first rate resolution of our first time resolution within our digital channels. So in Service New South Wales, we know the cost of delivery across our three channels. We know that if we can remove the barriers in our products and services, we're going to empower people to do that themselves, but we're going to lower cost of delivery. We're going to build customer satisfaction and trust in there. And we're also going to remove those discriminatory features and decrease the risk for the organisation. You'll see earlier on I talked about um, the need from a risk management perspective to look at this. For those of you who are in change management, what I would suggest you do, the W3C has their accessibility maturity model. I would actually call it more of an inclusion model. And it's a framework that looks at these multiple dimensions from comms, knowledge and skills, support for staff usually, uh, and customers in there, ICT developments, life cycle, your personnel, procurement and your culture. It will allow you to baseline where you are and where you need to go. Microsoft has its successive, um, a digital accessibility maturity model as well. The one thing I like about this one over the, over the Microsoft one, it's a little bit more um, broader in what it covers and you can download it and you can personalize it because it has a beautiful Excel sp spreadsheet connected with it. So you can benchmark your organization and look at the growth within there. The organization doesn't have to do all of it and they can focus on particular parts, but it then gives the organization good data about where it wants to grow. Now, why is that important? Because the research shows that when you develop accessible and inclusive products, you actually reach a market of three to four times larger than what you're um, trying to uh, reach. Now, such a Nadella's come out about that. We've seen stuff through the Centre for Inclusive Design, a whole range of different places. Now, what have we done at service as part of this process? We've um, anchored everything around the Australian standard. So that's our uh, essential standard. That's our policy document. And that looks at what and why we're doing it. We then have sensible defaults about what good is and about what our responsibilities and our methods and our tools. So yeah, one of the things I always say to people, and it starts with 365 and it goes, well, you spell check and grammar check. Did you click on the review tab and do accessibility check? It's part of our professional requirements within there. We've now using, and are using Microsoft Accessibility Insights, which is a brilliant, um, free plugin for uh, Microsoft Edge and for the Chrome browser there. Um, 
we do testing on all of our products every six months. Um, it's the only tool that I know that not only does the um, automated test that can be done, but it also holds your hand in doing the manual tests. So if any of you are working in organizations beyond the 365, which are developing web resources, have a look at that, that's brilliant. But then we use that six monthly proof and that comes into the success metrics of our organization. So that's part of how we do that. And so it becomes part of good governance and good practice. Now, from a culture perspective, it's looking at our design system, the tools that we use, our training and our advice. And so as we're rolling out 365 or rolling out any tool, where are the accessible templates? Microsoft 365 comes with some brilliant templates by default, but what happens in a lot of organizations is they go and make their own agenda items, they're making a whole range of other little templates which aren't accessible. The first thing I would be saying to everybody is, hey, let's go make a, a single set of accessible templates for your organization. And by default, let's install them on everybody's machine so we can start from that point. Then looking at the tools that you want. So um, you've got the inbuilt accessibility checker within 365, getting people to understand what it does, running some training and looking at the advice that you can provide on there. The other part of this as we move forward is knowing that everybody has a role. Now, I'm not expecting leaders to be accessibility or inclusion experts, but I am um, requiring them to look at against their obligations. And so in government in New South Wales, it's against the Government Sector Finance Act. What are they doing to develop mindsets, maturity, and metrics? Because we want to make sure that we're using our dollars wisely to deliver the services we're supposed to be delivering. And so that's the role of, of leadership in that process. But then it's knowing that everybody has a role, whether it's in this case, because we're developing products and services. What do I expect of a product manager? What do I expect of a designer or an engineer? And so is it in your comms team? Is it in your learning and development team? What are they doing that they have and being clear about what the expectations are, but what's the support that we provide them along the way to achieve that standard? So for us, the product managers, we're asking them to build in time into their process and align it to our initiatives and set um, conformance with WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, as our acceptance criteria, our definition of done. Why? because the Human Rights Commission and a whole range of other places around the world say, you've got to meet double A requirements to make sure it doesn't, um, it's not discriminatory. So learning to use that accessibility tool, accessibility checker, which is right across 365, enables you to reach the wider audience, but it also enables you to make sure you're managing your risk. And one of the things that we do is that we um, consult with customers all the time. We do customer research. What are their needs? Particularly when we're looking at writing in plain English, right? There's easy English and plain English versus easy read, which is an another level again, because we want to reach all of our audience. Now, one of the things that we do differently is that with that accessibility insights tool is we do paired testing so we bring the designer and the engineer back because the designer is like the architect of the house they've designed it now they then annotate their designs and that's one of their responsibilities and pass it on to the engineers which are the builders of the house but just like you might have seen on the block they'll go through and put the little blue stickers we'll do some quality assurance work in there and that's part of that process. But um, Accessibility Insights has saved us a fortune, but it's reached a wider audience for us. Now, what I want to do just before I go further is just reinforce. That's your core business requirement. Now, that core business requirement comes out of that Australian standard. What we also then have 
out of there is the definition of good. This is based on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Look, there's over 86 criteria, but what we do is, is simplified to this. It's got to be multi-sensory and flexible, right? So we make sure well, we add all text and images. Again, what Accessibility Checker will do, um, that all content can be used in different ways. So particularly if it's a web page, it works in a horizontal mode, but it also works in a vertical mode. It's clear and simple, right? So making sure it works in predictable ways and um, that all tasks can be easily understood. It's easy to use. And so we make sure that anything we're creating can work with a range of uh, input methods. Um, that we don't have um, time limits on specific tasks. Um, and also that it works with the inbuilt accessibility features that are inbuilt in the devices. So uh, Windows has some great accessibility features in there, particularly when you're looking at um, narrator and switch access now and a whole range of other things. And it's looking at how we make sure if it works with those features, we know it's doing really, really well. Now let's dive a bit closer into what it means to create accessible content using 365. Have you ever been asked to complete a project without crucial details or information? Imagine having to accomplish a task without any information at all. This is what it could be like when people with disabilities receive inaccessible content. Inaccessible content can have a negative impact on people with disabilities, productivity, and sense of belonging at Microsoft. If we want to create a more inclusive culture where people with disabilities feel valued and can work efficiently, then accessibility needs to be a focus when we create and deliver content. Meet Amanda. Amanda is a communications manager and just received a PowerPoint deck to review in preparation for a presentation. The deck contains images, videos, and text, but there is a problem. So it's simple because we've got those great features that are in um, Microsoft 365 and it goes even further. I'm just going to show you this next little video.
So it's amazing what's actually built in. Now, I'm going to show two more videos, one now and one in a little bit. The first one is about understanding cognition. We're seeing more and more awareness about people who are neurodiverse, and it's looking at those inbuilt tools that we have that can actually drive and support change within our organisations. And that's why good procurement helps to drive this change. And coming back to the Australian standard for a moment, 
it covers what we build or buy and it covers anything that has a digital interface so whether it's a hardware or software and so website apps any form of control mechanism and it covers anything from digital content whether it's text and images and sound the good thing about the standard it looks at the functional performance the testable criteria to deliver that performance and also the procedures and evaluation so it's now the common standard for organizations and you'll see it now more and more when people are putting in requirements for for what they're buying it's why at service new south wales uh, the essential standard on accessibility is based on en301549 and that's in there we've got that as that accessibility requirement from the start and the usability requirement from the start the test criteria being two, WCAG 2.2 or WCAG 2 ICT for mobile content. We do, we bring in our customers to and understand their needs. We build to the standards using our GIL components, and then we bring back our customers again as part of that process. And part of our go no go release is that pro, um, is that accessibility is an essential requirement, just like security. Now. It's a simple thing to bring in for any organization that you're working with. Set accessibility as a core business requirement. Define conformance with um, 301 or WCAG 2.2. Ask for proof. You can get a voluntary product accessibility template. We also ask for multiple proofs. So, hey, show me where it is in your help files. And can you give me a demo of those accessibility features? We assess and compare and we don't pay for products that don't meet standards. One of the products that we are loving, and I've heard Kirsty talk about it, is Copilot. But did you know that Copilot is an amazing piece of assistive technology? Let's have a look. So not only does it build productivity for a diverse range of your staff, but one of the other things does, it'll also decrease um, risks to do with, in related to emotional wellbeing and mental health. So we'll know everyone goes, hey, I can do this. I've now got the tools to help me. And this is where Copilot has been absolutely crucial in uh, how we've been trialling it within um, New South Wales government. It's made a huge, huge difference. One of the other things that it's also allowed us to do is use prompts within there about how we can simplify our writing. Because you might have heard that old saying from Mark Twain, you know, if you wanted me to write simply, you should have given me a longer time. 
So we're getting our content um, designers to create the content as per normal, but then we're giving it a specific prompt. And because there are readability tests and scores, we might say, give me a flesh Kincaid score of six. Why do I ask for that specific score? Because that's about the reading age of a nine-year-old. Then as the content matter expert, I can read what comes back from Copilot and go, yep, that still makes sense for everybody. So it's taken the hard work out. So it's actually improving how we deliver content um, to our customers. And it's a great way to use it, let alone our diverse range of staff who have been using it as well. And I think it's one of the big things to look at. How does it help staff um, from, with diverse needs and abilities? But also, how does it allow you to deliver more inclusive resources to your customers as well? Now, just quickly, um, some work on metrics. Now, this is going to go a little bit further here. One of the things that we've done here, that was with some of our new grads, we use that Microsoft Accessibility Insights tool to do the testing, all 67 tool, uh, teams. What we did was, how are we going to collate all these resources coming back? And one of the things in Accessibility Insights, you can export your result as a JSON file. If you've ever seen a JSON file, it's machine code and it gets really complex. Um, what we've done is built a little process where people come to a SharePoint page, they upload that JSON file, and using Power Apps and Power BI, it converts the results of the accessibility of their, pro of their product in one foul swoop. It takes two minutes. It then gives me the dashboard so I can see the level of accessibility of any of our products at any one time across all 67 product teams. But that was using Accessibility Insights with SharePoint, Power Apps, Power BI as part of that process. It means that we can also now share those results across the organization. Now, your next steps, I'm gonna put some links into the chat. I've got some links here, but I'm also gonna put them into the chat for you. Um, that you can access them, a favourite one. So there's a link to the accessibility tools, the accessibility video training for 365. Um, you've also got more on um, doing it better within Teams, the broader Microsoft Accessibility Essentials that's in there, and Microsoft absolutely brilliant um, MSFT enable YouTube channel. Um, it's absolutely superb. And the videos that you saw today have all come from there. What it comes down to is this. The changes we want to make so we can leverage the inbuilt accessibility and inclusive features that are in 365, it's as simple as getting together for a cuppa. We recognise that everyone's different. We inquire about people's needs. We offer choice and personalisation. And we have a great time. So I'll go, hey, Kirsty. What do you want to drink? Hot drink, cold drink? Oh, how do you take your tea or your coffee? Those questions just rattle off our tongue really, really quickly. And it's the same thing here. Let's make sure that we do inclusion just like a getting together for a cuppa. Kirsty, I'll open it up for Q&A and over to you. Very good. I'll have a uh, cup of tea, Earl Grey, please, quite milky, and at least just one sugar, you know, or, or <laughs> you know, saccharin, something like that. Yeah, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> if I could rule the world with tea, I tell you what, it'd be, uh, I'd be all on. Um, um, I, I just have a, you know, a question for, you know, every day. Um, where you know, using something like Copilot. So, say I'm in Word. How how inbuilt? I mean, I often will use, say, the microphone and I'll verbalise it because people can find it easier sometimes to have a conversation than they can to mm. type that kind of command. It's supposed to be a prompt, but they'll often just type a command. Are there any particular um, places that we can go to or do you know of that we can actually ask Copilot to help us make something more accessible? And what does that actually, is that actually in there yet in terms of Copilot um, to be able to help and support us? I know that there's, uh, you know, sometimes it's not in just yet. Yeah, look, 
it'll refer you back to a lot of this great stuff that's actually on the Microsoft site itself mm -hmm. because uh, Microsoft provides a wonderful array of resources. Is there a list of accessibility and inclusion prompts? Not necessarily. That's something that we could work on mm -hmm. uh, and particularly as a community. So where we ask it to, so when we say simplify the content, it's a really broad question. It is, yes, hence why I'm kind of going, do you know, yeah, where, and, and you, I mean, there are different verbs that we can actually use yeah. to be able to help and support. So I'm just wondering, are there particular verbs that we should be putting in to try and help us, you know, tailor it? I, I think it's us being spe more specific. And that's why, yep. for instance, because of that, like we know there are like, uh, what they say, about 30 or 40 different reading tools out there, readability yep. tools. We've chosen the most common and said, give me a specific score. And so I think it's those sorts of things and it's it, it depends on your organisation. But I'll send through the, the links that uh, our prompts that we've got on readability mm -hmm. um, because it's then meant um, it's, it's changed the quality of our content, but it's also improved productivity mm -hmm. for people, but it's also decreased our cost mm -hmm. in transforming our content through the use of Copilot. Okay. Um, and that's when you go, because some organisations go, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to pay for this. And we go, guys, here's the re here's the return on your investment. Mm -hmm. Don't see it as a cost, but see it as an investment. And mm -hmm. here's one of those returns on your investment, particularly when you see from a cognitive perspective um, that 47% of our customers that have low literacy, and it's, a, it's actually higher for numeracy. We have right. so right. it's then starting to think about how do we present um, information in in with simplicity and clarity, but also then use Copilot to help us present that information using charts. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very conscious, you know, I get a lot of organisations that I'll be working with um, asking to create content and create content that I kind of go, well, this isn't very friendly um, in any way, shape or form as a change manager because we're often rolling out a lot of new things. And when we're rolling out something new, we'll often have to educate. And then when we're educating, we then often are eliminating a lot of people that will need the education on features that could actually really help them. Um, and, you know, I, I'm quite conscious of that a lot of the times, or, and it depends on the business. Some are much better than others, without a doubt. Um, but, you know, it was one of the reasons I kind of reached out to you is because I have, I have, I'm having it way too often where they're really not considering from the end user. My, you know, philosophy is um, no user left behind. And a lot of yeah. people don't like the word user. Um, <laughs> and it's just like, well, in terms of technology, they, it's called end user. Um, and that encompasses everyone. And I mean, having just lost my voice with laryngitis made me very conscious, especially as a trainer, I couldn't talk. Um, and, you know, I've got a quite severely, you know, disabled uh, mother that I take on holidays and all sorts of things like that, that, uh, you, you know, kind of go in general learning and helping her with 365. And she's my bookkeeper, so I'm regularly helping her around accessibility and different things. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I think it's an important component that as adoption and change specialists and product managers out there to make sure that we're being inclusive. Very much so. And look, where we talk from a building perspective about um, trying to age in place, so have you built your building in a way so the doors are wide enough so you can actually get a wheelchair in there and that you've yeah, yeah. minimised your steps and all this. The biggest one now is on... Um, how do you enable your staff to age in place? You know, we're now hitting a, a situation where we've got um, up to five generations within a workforce now. Yeah. People are working uh, longer. And so we're going to need different supports at different times to age in place and personalise in that. Copilot is part of that. But it's also looking at about how we personalise the inbuilt features, not only of the operating system, but of those applications that we're using. And that's the biggest thing on change is you go, guys, it's really just like you adjust your car seat. You've got all these great features. The thing is that there's not that awareness of those features. Mm -hmm. And so I think the big thing for an organisation is, look, not only do you want to attract the best possible talent from the widest possible audience, you want to retain them. Hmm. 
Yeah. And so being able to have those features regularly on hand is the key to that process. Yeah, I um, I mean, I'm conscious of the um, uh, power doing PowerPoint Live, and I was part of a blog with Microsoft on PowerPoint Live, and it's you know it's very frustrating for me because I have very big presentations each month, and I can't actually use it for my user group, which is because it just it, it will fail when you've got mm. you know 130 odd plus pages. It just goes nope. <laughs> but for <laughs> everywhere everywhere else, I absolutely um I do. So if you if you're battling with Microsoft and it, at all, please feel free to tell them to fix PowerPoint Live to do more complex presentations. <laughs> I pass it on to the team as well, but I know that you've had a lot to do with them over the years. Yeah. Mm, and, yeah. Look, and look, as part of that feedback, can I just say the feedback needs to be gamified because it's like anything, the more feedback they get, the more it increases in their rankings on their to-do list. Yes. So, hey, everybody, if you want it, here's what you got to do. Vote. Go, Go vote. Go vote on, on the product feedback portal. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, vote early, anyone, vote often. That's it. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? Please feel to type in chat or put your hand up. Um, if we don't, I will move on to some of the new features in 365. Okay. Not seeing any hands. That's all right. It's going up at this point, uh, but um, they can always talk. About it. Thank you, and um, thank you for coming in, considering your morning. I do really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate that, Kirsty. So, you, I know. Take care, everyone. Have a great day, and um, follow all the great links that Kirsty's put up, and the other ones that I've had. And um, yeah, intentionally include everybody by design. That's it. And uh, for everyone, the presentation is, uh, uh, Greg's presentation is actually, a, there's a link in my presentation to his presentation for you so that you've actually got, you've got those features and functionalities there to be able to review it. Thank you very much for joining, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Okay, I'll start Bye. presenting my screen. Okay. To finalise now, we'll go into what features are actually new to 365. We've done the what's new to adoption, but now we've kind of broken it in the middle. Um, Greg knew that he might not be able to get here a little early, so I've broken it up today. He's done a little differently. Okay, okay. so the big news around the Copilot wave number two. And what actually came out? Look, there is a, there is a whole heap of new functionality that has dropped in. Some of it that's a little bit more technical, some not so technical in terms of the Wave 2 for a co-pilot. Some of the main sort of functionality, you've got the blog, you've got the YouTube if you actually want to watch it. I got up at, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning and and went and uh, watched, the, watched the live by the last kind of five minutes or so where I was struggling to... <laughs> Stay awake and I went, I watch the rest in video, um, but did get up and have a watch. So what's actually new, you know, some of the core things were, for example, um, uh, when it came to your presentation, it has functionality around the brand center. And in that brand center, you can actually ask Copilot to go, one, you bring in your PowerPoint uh, standard template. And as you're doing your Copilot and ask, you can do kind of outlines and continue the conversation and generating slides and adding in particular topics and documents along the way before you pr create the presentation. So it's like this, you know, this building as part of your presentation components. So I'm, I'm liking some of that. Um, next, next sort of uh, functionality is the fact that there's Copilot pages. Copilot pages actually allows us to have sort of multiplayer collaboration. It actually uses a loot file on a user-owned SharePoint embedded container. So in terms of SharePoint, if you're not quite sure what that actually looks like in its functionality, um, go online. There's videos in regards to it, what it actually looks like. So when you go in and you put your prompting in, you can go in the bottom and say edit in pages, what it does 
does is it actually generates that loop file for you in your SharePoint container. And from there, once you've got your content, you can also then go out and you can actually share that with others. So you can take it and go, I want to go share and send it off. And then it becomes this interactive loop component off the back of our search functionality in Copilot. So that's kind of that page and what it looks like. So you might want to make sure that people understand where their content is sitting as part of it when it goes, you know, do a do a page and start creating and sharing because information might get a little sort of spread um, if they're not quite sure what's going on. And um, the next one is Copilot in OneDrive. Now, OneDrive being it's now generally available in terms of Copilot functionality. Uh, some of that new functionality when it comes to OneDrive is the fact that you can actually um, do things like generate summaries. You've got um, as part of that in terms of SharePoint, the, the, the sort of that SharePoint library when it comes to the SharePoint and OneDrive. And I'll dive into more of the OneDrive in a minute. But in the SharePoint um, library is the ability to be able to create your own co-pilot agent off the back of your SharePoint. So you choose what it is that you want to include as part of that agent and, you know, uh, go through that functionality. It's kind of a uh, click and play. It's quite um, clever in terms of that low code, no code to create your own agent based on content that you've currently got available. Um, when it comes to OneDrive, that summarization of a file, um, generating FAQs from your documents and selecting up to five files. So the summarizing multiple files. So you can go, you know, one or multiple, by the way. So, you know, you can go up to, um, you know, a few and then just go, give me a bit of a summary of these type of files. Um, another one is having five files and comparing those files. You know, what is the differences between the content that you've actually got between these different files? So I'm really liking that one because it can even be, you know, what's the, um, you know, uh, what's the difference between my older version and my newer version or one that's got pretty much the same name, but I'm not quite sure, you know, what the difference is between them before I even open it. So that's a bit of a, you know, comparison functionality. Um, another one is asking questions about information that you need from the document so you can get some insights. You can ask, you can choose what it is that you want and then ask, you know, tell me a little bit more about something that you know that might be inside those documents. So it will give you a bit of a bit of a response there. So I, there's some great features in terms of your OneDrive and what's coming over into SharePoint. When it comes to some of the SharePoint, um, those building of SharePoint sites really quickly and easily, being able to rewrite text to fix a particular tone. So you can actually rewrite and say how you want that tone to look. And then uh, on top of that, you've got lots of great natural language and ways that you can actually apply new pages in SharePoint with brands and theming. Um, you can adjust and ask it to adjust things like topography, fonts, creating certain layouts, videos, imagery, animations, motions, all done in a natural language with Copilot to make fairly fancy SharePoint sites. Um, on top of that is, in terms of Copilot, the web search query transparency. So what you can actually do is, because we've got the web content that can actually be included, your user can go and manage your Copilot response, turn on those sort of web content. Now, it depends, of course, what's been turned on. Um, and the link here gives some of the technology solution around what that looks like to making and enabling for your users. Once that's turned on, you can then say and see the web searches that it's actually included on top of the documentation. So you can see that down here. Okay. So you can, um, as part of that transparency and what it looks like across the 365 in these um, in this functionality, there is two links, one to Microsoft Learn, one to the Community Hub around what transparency looks like for Copilot to ensure people know where their information is coming from. This is a little bit of a list as to, you know, what you can actually do in Copilot across all of the applications. Um, one to have a little bit of a look and a read because we often need to understand what that looks like from a you know governance perspective and knowing because people will ask all the time.
mum, I know I get it all the time when I'm training. Well, does that include how do I know what's happening? Um, and it used to be somewhat hidden. Now Microsoft is trying to make it quite transparent around where it's getting its information from. So they're working um, quite um, um uh, they're working in quite a depth to ensure we get some more transparency around it. Now, in terms of Copilot in Outlook, a new functionality as part of Wave 2 is prioritising of your inbox. So you can do your summaries, but off the back of it, up the very top, you can go in and select priority and you can go, what type of a priority is this message? And you can go, what's the topics that are actually going to be included or um, who it's coming from? You can then choose and say, this is a high priority and then click, you know, done. And what it does, it helps to prioritize your inbox and putting things a little higher in terms of priorities. Okay. Next one is um, Copilot and Excel and how it's starting to revolutionise both across um, enterprise as well as small business. So there's lots of functionality that's actually coming into play for Excel. I'll uh, do that. I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go, but go and have a look because there is a few different functionality there, including Python um, and being able to do Python. Uh, there was some... Um, information on one of the blogs that I've actually got in here around Python and using it for creating word clouds, for example, off the back of content that you might have in Excel. I did like that. Okay. Um, inside Microsoft Forms, there's some uh, there's a blog there around the quiz creation. I have talked about quiz creation a couple of times. It's got some step by steps and how to do it. A good blog. Now, the September update has not been available for Microsoft Teams, and there was only one thing that was highly technical, so it was very rare that I don't have anything to say in regards to what's new to Microsoft Teams. Ordinarily, we've got a massive, huge list, but the team side of things is slowing down. Um, and, you know, it's in terms of the new platform, it's a little quieter and we'll be moving on now to SharePoint. Now, remember I said last month there was nothing in regards to SharePoint. They're now putting out the um, what's new to SharePoint for the previous month at the beginning of like September. So I've only just got August. So we probably won't get September until the beginning of October. Okay. Yeah. So the few things that I haven't talked about previously is in preview right now is the new SharePoint start page. Um, there's some really cool functionality going on there in terms of being able to create off the back of these templates. Um, what I also liked in terms of the new um, SharePoint start experience is down the bottom, it'll actually have recent pages and kind of where you're at around drafts and published because sometimes it'd be quite difficult to try and find you know where is that draft that I've actually got you're kind of going in the back end and settings and trying to find it now it's actually surfacing it for you as part of a recent list that to me is just it's huge it's such a time saver I've looked at it and gone oh hallelujah I'm loving that feature it's something that's simple but oh it's done my head in the past trying to find pages that I've created and where is it across the different um uh, different sites now there is some videos as well as a there's a couple of different videos from the different teams as well as the community hub and different newsletters out there around what that looks like um, also as part of that is the new banner web part that's come into play and lots of improvements around the title area now i have touched on this previously last month but now we've got some more videos and interactive on how to do it, what what it looks like. Um, you can even now not have a banner at the top of the page. So the fact that you can even turn off banners is a bit of a bonus. So you can, it can take up quite a bit of space at the top. And I have been asked, can I actually remove it altogether? Well, yes, you can. Okay, new features. Um, as part of some of that update for SharePoint is the new brand center that's coming into play. Now, what I particularly like about Brand Center, and we have touched on this in the past, but it's really only now that we're finally getting a good understanding of what that Brand Center looks like as it's rolling out. It's the ability to be able to create it, create themes 
for your SharePoint, create themes for your business where you can go, what are the fonts, what are the colors, what are the images and have an image library as part of your brand center so that you can actually draw on it when you get into Copilot in PowerPoint, for example, you can draw on that brand center. It draws on and you can point it to these are the corporate images. These are the corporate colors. These are the corporate PowerPoint templates. And then you can even in ClipChamp then have branded kits so that when you actually go to do videos and building in ClipChamp, it will then look at those brand kits inside your brand center as part of where it points to, to be able to support you when it comes to keeping things on brand. Um, really fabulous. I'm really loving this direction. Um, it's going to make a huge difference to try and keep businesses on brand and be able to work that. Um, there is a video that's actually being put out there. It was only about five or six days ago it went live that will walk you through what it looks like to be able to build that brand center, what it looks like to be able to build out a theme in your brand center. So understanding how to actually work with SharePoint for whoever's setting it up is going to be important because it is a, a structural piece as part of a design component of setting up a brand centre, a SharePoint brand centre, um, and to work alongside your comms teams, for example, to, to make sure. So SharePoint, SharePoint, whoever's designing and creating and your comms team, whoever looks after your branding in the comms team, um, whether it be your designer, you will all need to come together to set that up, okay? Um, uh, another, some of those new functionality in terms of some of the site templates, some updates there in terms of some of the site templates. This is a um, uh, a blog on how to actually use those site templates to be able to support some of that learning. Okay. Um, now on drive, on demand is the office hours for OneDrive. They don't tend to put out as such anymore a um, blog. So we don't kind of have a blog around the what's new to OneDrive. Now, the what's new to OneDrive, watching those videos, what's happening, um, an important component in there is the OneDrive roadmap of what's actually coming over the next few months, so up to six months. Some of these things we've talked about and depth, it's still not here. So for example, well, actually it is kind of, it is coming in, like it's sort of there. Things like the colored folders, which we've talked about, you know, quite a bit when it comes to, it's in the web based, but flowing through to File Explorer on our desktop is sort of one of those functionalities. So there's there's a few things that are actually flowing out, one to go and have a look at and get up to speed on. Um, in terms of what's new to Planner in September, you can do your label columns now in grid view. So you can have those labels in grid view. There's some improvements around accessibility to be able to support you, including narrator um, will correctly read those selected values uh, in terms of progress and priority. Um, some other functionality is around the web app. So the Planner web app will um, adjust there is some changes that is coming to the design of it. I have talked about this. We now have a lot more information that's flowing in to be able to see Planner online, so in the web-based. Um, there's been a bit of a change as to kind of where you're seeing it in terms of the planner.cloud.microsoft to be able to support um, different views as well as the My Task, My Day, all flowing through in Planner, which it kind of includes then the, the to-do functionality flowing into the Planner. We had it in Teams, but it was only in Teams. It wasn't available through the web view, so we're starting to see some consistency going right across the various places when it comes to the app look and feel. Um, there is a little bit of a video in terms of the new functionality around goals coming into play in Microsoft Planner. So you can include goals. Uh, we've uh, looked at other functionality in terms of things like Gantt charts. If you've got uh, uh, Planner Premium, you do need Planner Premium to actually have goals included. I have included for you um, a link to the video so you could come in and actually play the video if you wish to. It's it's here. I'm not playing it at the moment, but um, uh, I'll move our way through. One to go and have a read of when you're or watch off when you're ready. 
Okay. It's kicking off now. I don't want you to kick off. Move forward. <laughs> okay. Um, what's new to Loop? A, a new functionality is uploading files into Loop workspaces. Now, it can only be up to a 250 gig in size file, a bit like we have limitations around our SharePoint and OneDrive. No different. So it cannot exceed that 250 gig file. Um, it will support a PowerPoint, Word, Excel, and PDF files. So in terms of its functionality, for you to be able to go and upload and how to be able to do that, okay? It does also support multiple file uploads, okay? In terms of Viva Engage, now I talked about this a uh, couple of months ago, but it is now in there and available in terms of uh, general functionality of having multi sort of those cross tenant communications often we've got businesses that have all kind of tied together and they've got their own tenant so what we've now got is those tenants all kind of coming together so you can have an all company community um now this functionality there is some new things that they're actually working on and one of those is the live events to be able to have it across the those all companies and um be able to work together okay another one is subscribing to topics in viva engage this allows people to be able to go what's the topic um you can do the alert so you can go if this particular topic comes in um alert me and if it it's uh gets posted anywhere as part of the topic then you'll get that notification um in here was a you know um, uh, what could you do? Some tips of what you can do to you know how to be able to subscribe, um, tracking topics, campaigns, different things that you might actually do. Why might you go in and subscribe to topics? So a couple of suggestions as to why. You know, we might say um, we will regularly share insights, articles, reports on, you know, different things like industry trends, for example. And if you're interested, maybe you want to go and subscribe to the this particular topic okay so that's a bit of an example another one is viva connections is now allowing pre-built third-party adaptive cards there is a lot of adaptive cards across different technology like maybe asana for example you might have that inside your business you'll be able to go and put on your dashboard different adoptive cards so there's all these different cards that then sit outside of the microsoft 365 suite in terms of viva connections so you can build your page and be able to go to your you know local connections page to sort of see what's actually going on so a bit of a new experience there okay um, go and have a look at the Glint blog. There is a couple of new um, um, uh, blogs, news articles that have actually become available in terms of their newsletter of what's actually come that links into Viva Glint. Something to go and have a look at. Um, one of them in particular that I do like that ties also into Viva Pulse is a um, what has Microsoft done to sort of drive employee engagement, how they actually set up so that the new functionality, which is um, from feedback to action, being able to send out follow-ups to be able to support the business around Viva Pulse. Um, that's sort of getting the pulse of the business. It's sort of a survey type pulses. If you're not familiar with Pulse, one thing to go and maybe have a look at if you're not familiar with those pulses. Um, in terms of what's new to Office, the um, long-term servicing channel subscription for Office is now available. This is that um, Office standalone in perpetuity. You know, you were used to be able to get your um, Office 2013 and once you purchased it, it just stayed on that device forever for as long as you like. Okay, there is the new version, the 2024 is now available. Um, this is important for organizations where, for example, that particular device can never be connected to the cloud, for example. Um, Defense in particular will use this sort of functionality where it says it needs to have Office on it to be able to read or do things 
things or whatever the case may be, but it cannot be connected to mobile or the web or can't have any cloud storage, for example. Um, it will only get security updates, but it doesn't get updated. It's a standalone, so it doesn't get all of the iterative updates like we do in terms of, you know, whether it be um, Outlook or PowerPoint or whatever, Those all those little iterative something in terms of a new feature of the Pro Plus for Office. So it's a standalone. Okay. In terms of what's new, um, there is a blog around the new, and well, it's actually not a blog. It is a, um, it's part of the Microsoft support, do you call them blogs, news articles, of which it has in there, um, somewhat new. It's just recently been updated. So you'll see September, it's recently been updated, of the comparison between new and classic for Outlook. So what does those features and functionality look like, for example, on the calendar? What do you get in the new? What do you get in the, in the classic? Uh, because there's a lot of contention around, well, why would I go to that Monarch new? version of Outlook um, and it's very much around some of those modern functionality that is on the fluid framework that you just won't get in the classic and it, it will it will be a long time yet by the way something like you know 2029 or something like that that it will go so we've got a bit of time but it is generally available outlook is now generally available the, the new one um so things will start to speed up i know that there's a lot of functionality that's still not available in the new just so that you're aware shared mailboxes has just come out and i know that has stopped a lot of organizations when it comes to using outlook there has been a couple of glitches though i have seen in terms of shared um mailboxes but it is out there it is now in um, kind of in that preview and, and functionality going out there. Um, also, in terms of what's new in Outlook for Windows, there is a this is kind of where it's going now. I'm not seeing a lot of functionality. It's over in Microsoft support to be able to have things like transcripts and recording um, coming into play in terms of Outlook. So there are a couple of new features. Another one in terms of Outlook across iOS and Android, on the um, learning site, it now has in there, play my emails in Outlook as a video. So if you want to maybe, I mean, if you haven't actually seen it before, um, you can always go to the Outlook for mobile devices if you want to do any education pieces on how they can actually do it on the go from their mobile phones. Um, another functionality in terms of OneNote is the new sticky notes feature in Windows. It's received a little bit of an update around being able to pin it and have it on your desktop, um, as well as being able to be able, you know, have them in terms of the forefront and be able to copy your note if you need to. So you can pin them and you can now copy them. So they've had a couple of new features that have actually come into play. In Excel, now... Copilot slash Excel, I kind of go, do I put this in Excel or do I put this in the Copilot functionality? It's a bit, sometimes it's always a, where do I put it? Um, but what I'm loving, and I talked about this in my last session, Microsoft have been putting out a daily update around how can you use Copilot in Excel? I mean, Excel is a beast, okay? Now, I like the fact that for quite a few weeks now, there is all these, if you go to the, um, if you actually go to the page, it's got a, um, a link to further information. It's got what can you do and a screenshot. So here you go. It's things like show me if there are duplicates in my data. You can ask that of the likes of Copilot, show me counting and highlighting duplicates, and Copilot will do it for you and automatically drop in and do some conditional formatting without you having to um, worry about it. Now, that's just one. Now, there's a lot in the series. So if you're actually on the Community Hub, the Excel Community Hub, they are pinning them up the top of the Community Hub if you want to keep um, keep a bit of an eye out for them. There's uh, part three, part four. Um, in this one, I've actually got in here to uh, how can you actually um, a, a convert column to several? So it's this first one. How do you convert one column? So here it's like you've got delimiters, for example. So these are your delimiters to be able to push things out and just ask, just ask 
co-pilot to do it for you. Um, on this particular one, it's a, I want to see information that's basically in a table based on release dates. So it's sort of showing those data insights based on a quarter. So this all these great commands. Um, this one was just a bit of a fun one. And this page was uh, driving into some of the fun things that you can do from a personal perspective. It's got salary, you know, uh, sailing itinerary, photo hobby, but this one is riddles. You know, tell me a riddle. <laughs> and there's some other ones that are in there uh, after it as well. There's some fun riddle type stuff. But I like this in terms of how can we convert that as change agents? You know, tell me a riddle. You can actually even put little things like maybe you're on Viva or, or maybe Viva Engage or maybe you've got your champs group or um, you're doing a bit of gamification. You might ask Copilot to give you a riddle about a particular feature to see if your end users can actually answer and who's the first person to answer and they might then um, um earn some points as a champ in in maybe their champs management platform. So I kind of, even though I've dropped it in there, I have a reason for dropping it in there because these are the sorts of things that we can go, oh, how can I use Copilot? And these are the ways that we can use Copilot. Give us a riddle. No? Um, other features and functionality. I think the main thing in here that I really wanted to talk about because I've touched on the other stuff I talked about um, trim range last month, um, Python and knowing Python, we've kind of uh, touched on and it is in the new around Copilot and Excel and general availability is the accessibility assistant. So there's some new functionality that's come into the accessibility assistant for Windows that I am particularly loving, which oh, it's moved, of course, um, giving you the accessibility toolbar and to be able to help and support you in accessibility inside Excel with this functionality. Go and have a look at the release notes, what's actually been updated. Um, a lot of the times it is, you know, we fixed, we fixed, we fixed, we fixed. There's plenty of we fixed. However, there is some functionality that sometimes does not go into any of the blogs, for example. Um, you know, uh, data aggregation functions in terms of group by, pivoted by. Now, it might come out over time. We might see more and more of it as it flows into the blogs, but sometimes they don't always get there. Okay. Um, of course, we've had our guest speaker in terms of events and conferences. Microsoft Ignite is coming up in November. You can go and register and do it virtually if you want to get up and go watch it virtually and watch the recordings afterwards as well. And I will talk about these in December uh, when it comes to what's going on at Ignite. The AI tour, just so that you're aware. It is coming to Sydney. So the Microsoft AI Tour, it's coming. It's also in December on the 11th. So December the 11th is the AI Tour and we're looking forward to I know I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully you're all looking forward to it. There is the events catalogue, lots going on that you could actually go and watch. Um, don't forget you've got community days all over the globe. Um, some of them are virtual if you're looking at what's going on. Um, my wheel, I've currently done an update but literally this week just so that you're aware Microsoft have changed it from Copilot for Microsoft 365 to Microsoft 365 Copilot they've gone back so if you're talking about it it is now Microsoft 365 Copilot and I just need to make that update and, um, and I'll I'll provide it to you. I've done a bit of a shifting around again of my my wheels. So that's going to come out soon. The recording will go live on the Adoption YouTube channel. And um, there is lots of new video content on the Collab Talk in terms of the M365 AMA where I'm answering questions for the community. Uh, so we've got right, oh, there's what's there? There's 11 new videos answering questions. So if there's anything there that interests you, you might want to go and watch the recordings. They're all fairly short and sharp up to around about 10 minutes max all my resource links where do you find my where do i find my information i have dropped in here this new page this is a new anz communities page that's actually live up on github um each one of these links drop and go into what are all the mvp communities so these are all their user groups where can you find other communities there's lots of content on this particular page i'd recommend uh, there is also our anz um information here 
don't forget there's the recordings from the past. I've got them here for the last sort of four years. Of course, there's plenty that goes before that, um, considering I'm at nearly nine years now, but these are the last four years of recordings. Now, just so that you know, what's next? I'm going away. <laughs> I am not here next month. So the next session is not going to be until December 3rd. I am away. I am off to do a three-week trip of the Northern Lights. I'm going to Norway. I'm taking my disabled um, mother and my bestie. We're off and, and doing a uh, ferry and going to see it while we can because it's at the end of the Solar Maximus of around about 12 um, years. It's coming to the end to be able to go do a Northern Lights trip. So we're going to be very cold um, and having a lot of fun on the ferry. So I won't be around next month. No, I'm not going to do the user group <laughs> from the ferry. Um, I might annoy an awful lot of people and there's, I hear it's not great Wi-Fi, so I don't want to put you through that stress and pressure. Uh, but I will take live, hopefully before too long, um, the next session on December 3rd for the end of the year. And of course, don't forget, the presentation is available for you online, including Greg's presentation. And hopefully, Hopefully you've enjoyed the session and I will see you again in two months. Oh, I'm probably going to have so much to talk about in two months, trying to get you up to speed on what's new. So um, expect a bit of a long session. Um, I am being focused on me. Yes, Diane, I, I really will be. It's going to be nice and quiet, unlike my four and a half weeks over in the UK where it was crazy and sane on the go. This one, we're going to be sitting on a, a ferry and chilling out an awful lot more compared to last time so I'll show you some photos when I'm back thank you everyone for joining um does anyone have any questions on anything that we've discussed or talked about if not I'll start the recording and you could always ask questions afterwards or you can raise your hand if you do have something you'd like to ask on anything that's come out even if not stopping the recording now thank you everyone for joining Hey, you're very welcome. There's always lots.